Ever since the dawn of time, software developers have been making and selling software. Naturally, ever since the dawn of time, people have been trying to copy and avoid paying for software. This led software companies to implement measures to prevent people from making and distributing their own copies. In today's video, I'm going to be looking at some of the more notable copy protection measures. I should also mention that in this video, I'm not trying to condone or condemn piracy, since I know this can be kind of a controversial subject. I'm just here to talk about some of the different anti-piracy measures that have been used over the years. So let's get right into it. forms of copy protection is known as on disk copy protection. This is where they like alter the disk by either corrupting certain parts of it or using something like a non-standard format. This meant the disk could be read but it would mess any kind of copy software because it wouldn't be able to copy the unique like corruption or disk format. This form of copy protection was really annoying because you couldn't make backups of your disks as well as couldn't install it to your hard drive if you had one. This was popular in the early days of the Apple II and IBM PC before too many people just complained about it and they stopped doing it and it became a selling feature if your software was not copy protected. This form of copy protection did stick around however on systems like the Commodore 64 since not very many Commodore users had hard drives and Commodore's drives were super easy to reprogram to read a non-standard format due to the way they worked. Another problem with this, especially with Commodore systems, was that the way this would mess with the uh, formatting of the disk could actually damage your drive if the heads, because these copy protection schemes would often cause the heads to bang around a lot, which would send them out of alignment, which is super annoying. It was almost like there was incentive just to get the cracked version because it would load faster and wouldn't mess up your drive. The next form of copy protection we're going to talk about is off-disk copy protection. This mostly affected games from the late 80s and early 90s, and the most common form of off-disk copy protection used the manual, where you had to find like a specific word in the manual and enter it in. Another form of off-disk copy protection, like SimCity here, has a single sheet with a bunch of like symbols. When you start up the game, on screen it'll show the symbols and they have to find the number that corresponds with that symbol and the sheet is like a dark red with black ink so you can sort of see it in the right light but if you tried to photocopy it, it you would just get a bunch of black. This was made quickly obsolete by better photocopiers. I should mention though that there is one benefit to having to look stuff up in the manual to answer the copy protection questions that is you can actually kind of learn something about the game from doing the copy protection. In the early 90s CD-ROMs were starting to gain popularity and in the early days of CD-ROMs, developers really didn't bother with copy protection because, well, CDs themselves were their own form of copy protection. Because CD, read-only memory. Keywords, read-only. CDs can hold way more than the average hard disk back then, and CD burners are prohibitively expensive. So developers didn't really bother with any sort of copy protection for early CD-ROM releases. As we get later into the 90s, CD burners are becoming more and more accessible and commonplace hard drives were getting quite a bit larger. It soon became apparent that copy protection was needed on CD-ROMs. That brings us to our next copy protection method, and that is product keys, also known as CD keys. Early product key systems were pretty simple and painless. You just, at some point in the installer, you'd have to enter in a random string of numbers and characters that would be like printed on the back of the CD case, and that was it. But early product key systems were about as secure as this gate, since you can always just write down the product key if you make a copy of it. So you can essentially just copy the copy protection. Moving on later on into the 90s, and simple product keys and CD checks aren't cutting it anymore. Now we have third-party DRM systems, like SafeDisk, SecuROM, and StarForce. With these systems, like a key would be applied to the disk during mastering and using a lot of like math and encryption and whatnot, it would basically prevent it from being copied and prevent copies from working. It's very complicated and I don't fully understand it, but it's basically just a much more advanced product key system. SafeDisk was a pretty uh, simple and 
pretty minimal measure and pretty easy to deal with and remove. Moving on to a Sekirom and Star Force, which were quite a bit more extreme. Star Force would actually like basically install itself as like a root kit and mess with your optical drive. Sekirom was also kind of annoying. Sekirom had some major uh, security vulnerabilities. Microsoft released an update a few years ago that basically made any Sekirom programs not work anymore due to these security vulnerabilities. Personally for me, Sekirom has caused its share of headaches since one of my favorite games in the whole wide world, SimCity 3000, unfortunately, is laced with Sekirom. But thankfully, we have things like GOG.com, which stands for Good Old Games, and it's got lots of uh, old games with the copy protection removed that you can buy for not a lot of money. So, super cool that they're doing that. So overall, Sekirom and Star Force were pretty annoying and hard to deal with. But now we're heading into the territory of even more hated DRM practices. Those being like accounts with the publisher, limited installs, and always online DRM. So basically all programs and games these days want you to have an account with the publisher. This is mainly for DRM reasons. In some cases it's not so bad. Let's take Minecraft for example. If you want to play Minecraft, you can actually just download it from their website. And they'll let you do that without paying. But you do have to pay for an account, and you need to sign into an account to play. But you can install it as many times as you want, and you can sign in on as many devices as you want. So you're not so much purchasing the game as much as you are purchasing an account to play the game. But accounts with the publisher can be used for much more annoying things like limiting the number of times you can install it on a number of devices you can install it on, as well as something called Always Online DRM, which is just super annoying. Always Online DRM has to be the most hated form of DRM ever. It mainly affects video games and basically if you want to play that game you better have a good internet connection because every little thing is synced to the cloud. Game companies will try to like mask the fact that it's for DRM by saying it's for like improved multiplayer or you can sync your progress across multiple devices but the reality is it's for copy protection reasons. Super noisy because you can end up with lag in like single player and your saves aren't even saved locally and if the servers are down you can't play the game at all. My biggest complaint with accounts with the publisher based systems are just that if you want to revisit a game or a piece of software in the future and the company doesn't support it anymore and the servers are down, you can't use it at all. So that's kind of unfortunate. So anyway, that's just about what wraps up. Uh, this look at different forms like copy protection and DRM. I found it a bit interesting and I know there's a lot of things I glossed over. It's just sort of a general talking about the history. And uh, yeah, and I might go and make some more videos in the future taking a more specific look at some of these, at some of the things I talked about today. But let me know if you want to see that. I also recommend you to check out my other channel called BTM286. I've had it for a while. I upload other just random little things on there that are just like just random little videos. You can go check it out if you want. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching. Have a great day.